SJC 13534, Camilla Davalos et al. versus Baywatch Inc. Okay. Attorney Golazuski, whenever you're ready. <coughs> Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, John Golashevsky on behalf of the plaintiff's appellants. In response to the certified question from the district court, this court should do three things. One, it should reaffirm its 2014 decision in Harrington versus Costello wherein it said, quote, the more precise way to state the discovery rule is that a claim will accrue, quote, when a plaintiff discovers or with reasonable diligence should have discovered she was harmed by the defendants. Number two, it should confirm that that holding, which has twice been reaffirmed by this court, both in 2020 and in 2022, applies also to claims that are emanating from, as in this case, social media publications. And number three, it should reaffirm that whether a particular event or events either in fact put a plaintiff on notice she was harmed by the defendants, or reasonably should have put a plaintiff on notice that she was harmed by the defendants, is generally an issue of fact for but the didn't, jury. Didn't, were, were you the law, was your law firm the law firm that was hired to buy the plaintiffs to find this? That's accurate, Your Honor. So you did find it. Um, once we they did. hired you, you found it. Don't they have to, so it's not inherently unknowable that are your, have magic powers. Well, um, so I, I, why isn't the normal three years apply? Because they could have hired you any time during that three-year period, and you would have found it. Well, I don't know that that's necessarily so, Your Honor. Well, the but fact you, that did, they hired you me, did find it. Well, the fact uh, that we did find it, Your Honor, does not mean that, that well, it was not inherently unknowable. My client's well, images, oh, it, please. It, I guess I just don't follow that. If sure. so, the. Your clients discover they're worried that people are exploiting their images. Correct. They say, well, let's find out who's doing it. Correct. They hire very capable counsel. You find it. The problem is they waited six years to hire you or whatever, rather than doing it right up front. So uh, I, I guess the question is up front from what, Your Honor? As soon as they, they have the ability to monitor the use of their images, and how, how so? By hiring someone like you. Right, but Your Honor said up front, we don't know, the plaintiffs don't know when their images are being used. Their images are exploited by thousands, thousands of companies. But doesn't that suggest that they should start policing right away then? But, but again, Your Honor, with respect, right away vis-a-vis <clears throat> -vis what? Right away once they start releasing their images to other people that are using their images. My clients' images have been used lawfully by people for decades, Your Honor. My, my clients are professional models whose images are licensed and used for decades. So this goes back decades then? This, they, uh, the, the, the claims here, I believe the first advertisement was 2013 or 2014. Right, but, so, but you're saying that your clients' pictures have been used for decades, so why not go back the other 30 years then? in terms of? Go back even longer than. And, 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 well, maybe so, but, but the question is, what does reasonable diligence mean here? That is, under your honors, maybe I'm misinterpreting, under your honors suggestion, the day a professional model decides to license her image to company A lawfully, she is then has some duty of inquiry to make sure that no other company in the world is using her image. And, and I don't know about believe she that. She just has a three year statute of limitations to enforce misuse of that image. <clears throat> Well, again, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm, you understand my question. I, I, I do, but but when we're talking about the discovery rule, what we're talking about is reasonable diligence. And if, like if inherently unknowable means that plaintiffs' counsel uh, could not have found it, would we ever have a suit? I mean, that is. It, it seems that the test cannot be. Aha! Your lawyer found it. Um, and therefore, you don't, you're not entitled to the discovery rule. I mean, the discovery rule must mean something. Which is exactly right. And again, what we discuss in our reply papers that the defendant's position is that no publication ever, whether it's on online generally, whether it's on social media, whether it's in a newspaper, 
whether it's in a magazine, it can, the discovery rule can never apply. And that is simply antagonistic to what this court has held since at least the Flynn case in 1988. That is, in Flynn, the, this court did not say. Well, there's a difference between cancer. You don't, it's inherently an unknowable. You get cancer, and you don't know you have cancer because it's not going to manifest itself. That's a lot different than you know, having your picture on the internet in a publicly disseminated site. There's a difference. It's not just whether a lawyer can find it, but whether at the time it's findable. Well, yeah. I, again, I don't, I'm not sure what the term publicly disseminated means in this you, case. Aren't these Honor. websites, aren't they, you, they're open to the, that's how they attract business, right? They're not, it's not like a, there's a, some kind of, privacy protection of these websites. Well, they are open for business, right? I, I disagree with that. Okay, they, are, they are concealed under the definition of Wolfsfeld insofar as that they are not can, discoverable vis-a-vis -a, -vis a search can, engine can query. I, can, yeah, can I ask you about the steps to, to, to discover it? And, and I, sure. I, I think you know, Justice Wagner makes a great point that we'd never have, we'd perversely penalize in plaintiffs for bringing suit. But anyway, um, to get to these, to discover this information, you would have to go on to all these clubs in various areas and then look at their Facebook pages to get that. The only way to find it, that is exactly right. What you can't do is a Google image search. Ab absolutely not. And, and I think and this is... has to do with the reasonableness of diligence. As, as So basically your plaintiffs, your clients, would have to go into every club in Oklahoma and to see whether or not every club in Oklahoma has or what clubs in Oklahoma have used these images on their Facebook pages. That is, that is precisely right. And I think it's important in light of, in the opposition, this reference to this Facebook facial recognition software, which A, has no bearing on the certified question response, and B, is not accurate because there is no evidence that you can find an image that is in an advertisement or is in a flyer. That, that facial recognition is talking about when a friend uploads a picture of a friend to Facebook, and that these is are facial These are local clubs advertising these images on, on their own Facebook pages. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again, Your Honor? These are local clubs advertising these images, that, stealing these images for their own Facebook pages. That's exactly right. Okay. And, and importantly, and keeping them up. You know, when we're talking about generally the reasonable diligence inquiry in the defamation context, for example, you have a, a news publication, and maybe it got a lot of press, and maybe it didn't. That's sort of the Flynn case. Um, the libel is published. And then the next day, there's additional news that comes out. Here, they are using these images for years. They are reaping the benefit of well, these uh, images for Newsprint years. Newsprint is easier now because there's Google Alert, and you can figure out uh, if, <coughs> if the Boston Herald, unlike the, the case that's cited, um, where you should know what the one of the Boston Daily said about your about the client. But uh, here, uh, uh, you have Google Alert, you could, you could know this well, easily. Can I have a related question? So would you agree and concede that if technology advanced such that we got um, what I'm going to call Super Google, like a sort of a image search that was, was omniscient, right? And so your clients could, because they are professional models who license their photographs, um, could easily just like the Google, the like having a Google alert for your name, have a Google alert for their face mm -hmm. that would cover su things such as different companies all across the country's gentlemen's club website. If that tool existed, would you agree that they um, probably would have to bring a claim within three years of an image going up? I would absolutely agree. That would be a much harder argument for me to make that this is an issue of fact for the jury. I absolutely agree. So that so, so, so that, you having agreed with the extreme hypothetical, which I appreciate, we've been asked in this certified question not really to answer the question in this case, but to say what we think, you know, how the court should approach this question in this new context where we have not ever written an opinion in this context specifically. What precisely do you think are the variables vis-a-vis -vis the internet, number one, um, which we've, you know, the appeals court at least has addressed um, to a degree, and then secondly, social media. So you raised already the issue of the availability of image search and also the availability 
presence or not in Google search results, which were noted in the Wolfsfeld case. Mm -hmm. What other variables do you think are pertinent? I, I think there are a handful, and we lay them out, which is, is the plaintiff a follower of the defendant's social media? Does the plaintiff reside in the same town as the defendant? A, an example is, there's a, a Stoughton Journal that has a Facebook page. Stoughton, Massachusetts is where this is. Or Stoughton. Stoughton, I apologize. <laughs> I'm from New York, I apologize. Yeah, no, I kind of, kind of figured you were not a town. Um, if a libel on an issue of public interest was printed on that Facebook page, and my client was a resident of that town, I think it's very hard for my client to say that she can avail herself of the discovery rule. I, I really do, and that's a social media publication. So where is the plaintiff located? Where is the defendant located? Is the offending advertisement or publication, is that republished, i.e., does she have reason to know about it? If it's published on the, the journal uh, Facebook page, but then it is picked up by the New York Times, I think my client has a very hard time saying, I didn't know about this. There's no way I would have known about Co this. Counsel, can I just ask you about the other side of the coin? Sure. Because even if you list all those factors to, in response to Justice Dewar's question, let's talk about your clients. And your clients aren't in any of these groups. So in, in reality, there is no statute of limitations for your clients' claims. Because you're going to turn around and say, all of these local places in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, all of these clubs that are using my clients' images, I'll never know about it until I know about it, because it's not on the internet, I can't do an image search, it's this private, not necessarily private, but it's a social media owned account that I'll never come across it unless it's not really knowable. So what becomes, if we're looking just to Massachusetts, what becomes of General Laws Chapter 260, where now, 20 years from now, your client who's in California comes to find out that there's some local club in Dedham that happened to use some picture, and now here comes the cause of action. What you're saying on the one hand is, we do not, we, we are gonna destroy the dis discovery rule if we do it this way, but the, but the price that we pay for that is we eviscerate the statute of limitations. Uh, and, and I appreciate that. One issue before I answer it, which is that my clients have testified in deposition after deposition that they have been alerted by fans of theirs. I mean, we're talking about women who have millions or tens of millions of social media followers. They have absolutely been alerted of other people, that is by fans, someone uh, direct messaging them on Instagram or Facebook and telling them, hey, we saw this. So I think right then, your cl my client would be on notice. So it's not just a matter of someone coming in 20 years later. There are many, many examples of that happening. But uh, on the question of do you get a that is, 20 years from now, could we come in and say, well, there was no uh, reason for us to know about this. We're looking at, we're looking at triggers. This is, what, this is what this court has said f since 1974 at least. What is the event that was likely to put the plaintiff on notice of her claim? And if it happened 20 years ago, uh, you know, when we're not that extreme, but again, I would defer to what this court has consistently said. What is the event or events? But, Why should she have been on notice? Uh, well, I don't know that we can consistently say because we wouldn't be here with a certified question if that were the case. Well, right. So, so the the issue of about what to do in this context is a little bit more nuanced than that. So, you, you know, you take the view that either on a de it's it's not really like a defamation case where the 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 lever is pulled on publication. It's not really like that. You're looking to and saying there's got to be some trigger. That's what I'm focused on. And if your client happens to be not, uh, you don't have a large social media following, you don't get some good Samaritan that said, hey, I saw this in my local town and I know you're half a world away. I'm talking about that case. And that case under your scenario, there is no statute of limitations. I, 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 right? I, I, can see, I can see where it goes there, but, but again, there, there are, when we're looking at defamation, and maybe the, the term to use is not trigger, but when we're looking at defamation, when you look at Flynn, and you look at Wolfstead, and you look at the Cass case that they cited, mm -hmm. extremely public dispute. There was, the Boston Herald was writing about this. The Boston Globe was writing about this. We're talking about extreme publicity. There was zero publicity about these advertisements. Mm -hmm. So, so while, while I think there is a distinction between a misappropriation, and if you look at Flynn, what is the quote, gist of the action, there's a difference between misappropriation and defamation. But even if the court was to say, no, we don't agree with that. We're talking about publication. Then I want to know, 
what notice the plaintiffs would have gotten. That is, was it extremely public? That is, some of my clients are, are very well-known people. Her image was used to, uh, in, a, in a dental practice in Massachusetts. That, that could easily get press. And if that gets press and someone says, hey. The, if that gets press in Stoughton and your client lives in LA, well, um, I, I just don't know how this is going to work. I, I, I agree that, that and you're, it's. You're, all these clients, are, they're national models, right? They're, they're national figures. So this local rule doesn't make any sense, does it? Whether if you got notice in your town, it just doesn't seem. And also, that the Massachusetts case, right? It, they, the actual article that caused the, the suit wasn't in, even though she, the person was in that town. The article appeared in Iowa or something like that, right? Uh, um, which case is that, Your Honor? I'm sorry. The the appeals court case. The, I thought, the, I thought the, wolf, the wolf set. No, the wolf set was the. I may miss. There are two this. cases, right? I can't remember. There's one case where. There's a local publication, but it's also republished in another state. So there's, there's right? the Flynn case where the AP came down, and it got pu pu published both in the Boston Herald American and in the St. Louis Dispatch. And the, what the Flynn case turned on, it turned on a few factors, but one was the fact that there was an extremely public um, dispute that was picked up by a lot of different news organizations about racial tensions in the high school, right. number one. And then number two is that the Boston Herald American was available in Flynn's hometown. Flynn's grandfather was collecting clippings about all the press. They had considered bringing a defamation case in 1978 against other entities. He was on notice that there was extraordinary but, press about this. So in your case, the equivalent would be, OK, she lives, I don't know where your client lives, but uh, she lives in New York or LA or she lives <sighs> Chicago. And there's a, some, t some club like his in Chicago puts it up. Is she on notice about? all the clubs in the middle of Nebraska that are doing this? She's not. But, but again, A, we look to the policy behind the discovery rule, which is that it is unfair to punish a plaintiff before she knows or should have known. And then I'd also ask, what interest are we really protecting here? Well, I'm that not is, saying there's anything honorable about what they're doing. I'm just trying to understand what the statute of limitations I, is. I think the statute of limitations is going to be based on what she knew or reasonably should have known based on what events occurred. And I agree, in these situations, there's, there's not a specific event they can point to. Is there a case like yours th that defines inherently unknowable the way you're describing it? Uh, there is not. What, what I have noticed since 2014 in the Magalia Cain case. The closest case to this wide, because, I, again, I, maybe I'm misconceiving inherently unknowable. But to me, it's always in the cancer or the environmental contamination. I, I may just not be familiar with it in this context. Well, the, 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 there's the Ortiz case, which has differences, but it is a Section 214 right of privacy claim in which um, there was no talk about a uh, single publication rule, whether there's a reason the defamation. Um, now, in that case, the plaintiff's lawyer received certain documents. And the uh, Court of Appeals said, well, that was suspicious circumstances that would have put the plaintiff on notice. That's easy, that case. Well, but in, but in all of these cases, and there are reams and reams, including those cases, that you're always, courts are always scouring the record. They're always looking for the event that would have put them on notice. And if there's no event, then they say, and they will have an opportunity before a jury to say, you know what? They have brought, collectively, X amount of cases. They should have been on notice of this. And I will say, well, why should they have been on notice of this? And that's going to be for the jury. Again, what we're talking about here is deference to the jury, generally. That is the general rule here. This is the Riley case that Massachusetts courts show no reluctance whatsoever to let juries decide issues of fact relating to statutes of limitations. That's all we're talking about here, that, that the court should not be making a determination as a matter of law that the plaintiffs in this case, uh, the, the claims accrued upon publication, especially when the images were being used for years thereafter. Um, I see my time is up unless anyone else has any questions. Okay, Thank you very set. much. Thank you. <clears throat> Attorney Monson. May it please the court, uh, Chris Monson for the appellees. Uh, Madam Chief Justice and Justices, the, the Wolfsfeld case is directly on point here. And the ruling and the holding in that case is what should be adopted moving forward in our new digital world. And Wolfsfeld is on point here because it took a look at something that's posted in a relatively obscure part of the internet, the Gloucester Times. Weren't the parties from Gloucester? 
I'm sorry? Were not the parties from Gloucester where the in Absol altercation took place? Absolutely, and, that, and that's a key part of the, uh, the holding, is that it was available to the plaintiff. Facebook, where these images were posted, is a massive uh, publicly available website. It's not all publicly available, though. Uh, yes, Your Honor, you're correct, but these images were publicly available. They were not behind any firewall. They were not behind any privacy walls. They were all available to the public for anybody who chose to search for And them. how does one search an image on Facebook? Uh, back in the time frame between 2010 and 2011, Facebook offered facial recognition searches where you could search based off of your face, and it would identify different images of you throughout the Facebook platform. That was readily available tool on Facebook. One just opened it up and said, hey, if you want to see, you know, Justice Wenlant somewhere, just go ahead and, and, and do face, Facebook rec facial recognition? For your account. And each of these plaintiffs had an, an account. So and you, that's in the record? Yes, Your Honor. I think it starts at page 47. With 47? The, uh, I'm sorry, RA247 with the New York Times article. Now, that has since been pulled down as of December. Wait, you have a New York Times article for this? A and the publication. Anything that's actually admissible? Uh, the publication from Facebook itself on the, the issues. Doesn't the New York Times article say that what this tool was, was when users had photo albums, the uh, tool would automatically tag people um, and say, oh, there's Brian Jones, there's Brianna Jones, et cetera. And they have raised the um, the other side has raised the question whether this would even apply. This would even, tool would have even been applied by Facebook or whoever to an advertisement of this kind. Is there anything in the record bearing on that question? Uh, yes, Your Honor. So there is different aspects of it. The the, uh, the tool did, did did exactly what you talked about. But you could also set a uh, a, uh, a notice anytime that a, a image of yourself is posted onto Facebook that you would be alerted to it. But where in Facebook? To any, any publicly available, my understanding is to any publicly available uh, uh, Facebook page. Anything that was posted of you, you could, you could get notified of that. In 2010? So 2010 into to December of 2021, and then Facebook removed that feature. Is there a finding of fact to this regard by the judge who certified the question? I don't believe so, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, wouldn't this be a jury issue then? Right. Well, Your Honor, I think we have to take a step back and, and start back with the beginning on what is inherently unknowable. And the court and the appellate courts have gone through and repeatedly found that inherently unknowable means incapable of detection through reasonable diligence. Not, did not find it because I searched for it reasonably. It's incapable of detection. And that's the standard that's been applied for more than 40 it's, years now. It's, it's, it seems to me that it, if we have this d debate about whether or not facial recognition um, on Facebook was available to these plaintiffs, this seems like a perfectly fine question for a jury to answer. I, I understand the position there, Your Honor. Uh, I would say that I, I don't think it gets to a jury because it's not inherently unknowable without uh, taking into consideration even the facial recognition software. It's not incapable of detection. Um, as Through versus, reasonable diligence. Uh, Correct, Your Honor. Okay. Incapable of detection. No, Through reasonable just... di diligence. So what Absolutely. the question is, what is reasonable diligence? Uh, I, I would suggest to the uh, the court, and is backed up by the, the, the case law that we cite, reasonable diligence is when you hire somebody to find it, and they can find it, that's not incapable of detection. That's but the that Melrose runs policy. into the same issue, that if you hire an attorney, it, we would never see these cases. You, your Honor, I right, think the discovery the, rule would never apply because, by definition, at some point you found out. Absolutely, but the so that can't be the test. And if I could address that, the discovery would, rule would still apply because even if the cause of action is inherently unknowable when it happens, there could be a, an event later on that causes it not to become inherently unknowable, and that's when you get to the reasonable diligence and the actual knowledge. Uh, elements of the uh, discovery rule test. So it's first, is this even an inherently unknowable cause of action to trigger the start of the discovery rule? And then, what uh, was it reasonable for them not to find out until X date? And did they actually not find out until X date? In your view, the event is the, the lawsuit? Uh, the event is, the well, initial event is the publication of these images. Right, but what's the trigger, right? So if, if you have these plaintiffs who are in LA or Miami or wherever, What's the trigger to, to find out what's going on in this club 
And sure. And, and that uh, follows the, the single publication rule and the defamation uh, side of all the cases that we've cited that the offense happens when it's published. Right. Uh, and, and to support that, you, you take a look at these claims, and these claims are that these plaintiffs were injured because people in their industry saw these images and that, that, that was detrimental to their career. And they can't have it both ways. They well, can't. well, yeah, I mean, they can. They, I mean, they can be models and like they don't want your club uh, to have pictures of them. They can be damaged by that. Without being paid. But that's not <laughs> yeah, the, without being paid. <laughs> absolutely, Your Honor. That's not the point I'm, I'm trying to make. The point that I'm making is if the industry saw these images and they were damaged because the industry saw these images, then these images are not inherently unknowable. If people in the industry saw them. Are there any, I mean, you would think there'd be, given this is a, it seems like a widespread problem, misappropriation of images of celebrities and beautiful people. Are there cases that define inherently unknowable the way you want us to define it? Yes, Your Honor. Because um, it's not the ma those two Massachusetts cases you've cited. They're, they're different. The, the Flynn and the Wolfsfeld cases really? are more about publication, but the, uh, the incapable- They're saying their clients are everywhere. I'm, I mean, they're famous, they have a million followers, their images are very popular, uh, and, and people like your clients are misappropriating them and saying basically they appear in their adult entertainment clubs. Um, how do they, how do they keep track of all of this and I just don't know how this works um, in and it's not that Massachusetts case where you live in Gloucester the Gloucester Times publishes an article and then it gets republished somewhere else that's easy this is much more difficult isn't it to police but I'd, I'd say in terms of geographic location it is a little bit trickier but in terms of what these plaintiffs are and what they do for a but living are there cases like this because this seems like this should have happened some this statute of limitation problem should have come up somewhere in this context. You've, have you found anything to help us? I found uh, cases through California, Illinois, Delaware. Um, not by the inherently unknowable into the Facebook social media. Not specific to face, uh, Facebook. I don't think. How about um, social media in general? Um, to website posts in general. In which case is that in your brief? Let's see. Well, website posts are different, right? I mean, I, I, obviously you should find in your brief where that is, but website posts seems different than social media. I would agree, and it, it, in fact, I think it weighs in favor of the appellees in this case. Why is that? Because these are plaintiffs who make their living off of social media. They are social media influencers. They know these networks, they know Facebook, they know how they work better than most of us. They, not they, they know how it works, but they aren't necessarily looking at random gentlemen's clubs' websites all across the entire country, right? They've been on notice since at least 2016 when they started filing similar lawsuits. <coughs> that of these, these images? Of these images and similar images. And that's in the, uh, the appellate I thought well. that was the reason that um, the judge reversed the prior decision. Yes, the, the 365... Uh, cases that was, or the causes of action that was included in the statement of fact was just similar claims. We supplemented that with specific, these specific images that are in dispute in this case from each of the plaintiffs that occurred at least three, that were at least part of lawsuits at least three years before this lawsuit was filed. Are, are you aware of, um, I, I recognize that this context is a little different than many because they are licensing their images. They are sending the images out into the world, and so they are on, on notice, at least, that their images are out in the world, which is not true for everyone. Um, are you aware of any case law that has held that um, reasonable, reasonable inquiry efforts include having to literally hire a lawyer um, because of the nature of your situation? Like, in other words, hire someone else to do diligence for you because it is clearly not possible for this person to do it. Yeah, I think I don't have anything specific on the social media, specific to social media, but I think the Melrose housing case is on point on that. It's more of a construction case where they hired individuals to monitor the construction and ensure that the construction was built properly. Uh, I noticed that case in your brief, and you cited a couple of others, and the difficulty is those cases are situations where the parties were all already in a relationship with each other, right? Like a house was being built or a project was being done and you know they already knew about each other. And the difficulty here is that it's, I think you have to concede a little bit of a needle in a haystack problem. We're talking about images that may be on the individual Facebook pages of any number of clubs. Um, and it's just not possible for a single human <laughs> to probably 
really in a year look at the social media pages of every single club in the entire country. Um, although obviously these people were able to hire lawyers who found a bunch of <laughs> images. So I'm, I just would be interested in your thoughts on how the reasonable inquiry inquiry should happen in this kind of context. Yeah, I think uh, in, in some of the other jurisdictions call it the mass media um, inherently unknowable uh, part. And I think California uses the mass media. But when it's posted up. I don't find a California case in your brief. I'm or, sorry. I, I don't think I put them in my brief here. I have case sites for you if that's. Yeah, that would be useful if you got a case site for us. You could submit a letter if yeah. you haven't done it after argument. Will do. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, but in any event, the, the, the question is whether, and, and it goes back to the policies as well, wh whether something is inherently unknowable. If it's out there in the world, just like a newspaper article, even if it's difficult to search for, even in Flynn, it would have been difficult for Flynn to have searched for through every periodical for, you know, say the 12 months period around the incident, read every edition of every periodical. Uh, it, it, it didn't matter. What mattered was that it was publicly available and he could have found it. It wasn't incapable of detection. And that's, that's the point that I think we drive home on our, our brief is that it, it's not so much what they knew or what they, uh, or how much effort it would have been to find it, but whether it was publicly available. And but but we, can't, we can't hold individual humans responsible for knowing the entire internet and particularly the entire internet that is not, will not come up in a Google search, which I think we can assume people can do Google searches, right? So how do we draw the line between uh, the world of Gloucester, Massachusetts, and the entire world? Very, very good question, Your Honor. I think it's, it's how widely available the, uh, the, the uh, website is. Facebook is widely available and publicly available and known to these plaintiffs. This isn't a website that's from a foreign country that's obscure on the black, mark, or on the black web or dark web. It's not, um, it's not hidden at all. It's not uh, behind a firewall. It's not behind any type of... Uh, I just don't know how that could be the limiting principle because, you know, without getting too deeply into the technology, we know that there are algorithms that are going to do things that are local to you. And Facebook is one of the largest social media platforms that we have in the world. And so the idea that you could be sitting someplace in California and it would aggregate uh, Facebook accounts in everywhere. I mean, it, it, it presumes something that I don't know how we're going to write that rule, where it's not publicly available in the sense of you can't do a Google search on it. There is this closed ecosystem of Facebook that even that, as a subset of the Internet, is still incredibly vast. And now plaintiffs now have to, to, have to be tasked with essentially constructive knowledge of the entire Facebook <coughs> ecosystem how how is that going to really work I mean again you, you you say that it's analogous to this case where we're talking about the newspaper but how are you supposed to have constructive knowledge of what goes on in Cali from from someone in California to what some local Facebook page is doing in Maine how, how are you supposed to really how are we going to how are we going to say that Help us say, because we, we've got to answer this question. So tell us how we would respond to the, to the district court judge in, that way, in this way. I, I'd say it goes back to the, the policies behind the statute of limitations, Your Honor, and at some, at some point, we have to draw a line where litigation has to end. Right, but the problem with that is that there's this exception under the discovery rule. And so what we're trying to do is balance the reasonableness of both enforcing a statute of limitation and not tagging people with knowledge that's unreasonable for them to have had. And Your Honor, the legislature is, and as I mentioned in my brief, the legislature has consistently demonstrated its ability to craft statute of limitations that take out the inherently unknowable um, uh, part of the discovery rule when they see fit. And that's the- uh, Right, uh, I've got those. Not, not only the um, uh, crimes or, or offenses against minors that we cite in our brief, but also um, when there is uh, fraudulent concealment, that statute of limitations, which is Mass General Law, uh, have you thought about the trademark analogy here? So if I have a trademark, I need to go out there and police it, right? And, and so I do hire attorneys to constantly search the web, the social media aspects, um, and make sure that others are not using my mark, because if I don't do that, I will dilute my mark. Have you 
at all discussed uh, or thought about the analogy uh, of, of that in this context? It, it's not discussed in our brief, Your Honor, but I think you're on a very strong uh, footing there that um, there is precedent under the trademark side for such policing of images, especially when they're known to be used as they are in uh, the plaintiff's cases exemplified by- And how does that inform our analysis of what is reasonable in this space where uh, the plaintiffs are models who know <coughs> that their images uh, have been misappropriated in this way? I think once that knowledge is out and that, that is, uh, it's clear to them that they need to start that policing, that's enough to at least trigger, if we're, if we're talking about a triggering event, that's enough to trigger them to start policing for their images, as they do in trademark cases. And so what we would need to do is find out the facts, as Justice Gaziano was alluding to, as to what tools were available reasonably to these particular plaintiffs. I'm not so sure that you'd need any more facts than when they started filing the lawsuits, because when they started filing the lawsuits, they started clearly having attorneys who found these images and were able to, to do this type of work. Uh, so I would argue that that's the, uh, the appropriate marker to go by uh, under that analogy. I also wanted to, and I noticed my time is almost up here or is up here, but it's also uh, important, the burden here. Uh, the burden is on the party claiming the discovery rule to present the facts that the discovery rule applies, not the, party, not the other party. Uh, and I think that's important to keep in mind when responding to um, the certified question here uh, because of the plaintiffs are the ones who know how this was found. That they, they know how these images were found. They have it through their counsel. Two of the plaintiffs in this case have testified they can't remember when they found her when they first became aware of it. Well, your, your clients know better off. I mean, reading your client's uh, deposition transcript, your, your client knows nothing about nothing about nothing. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, and, and who put it up? I don't know. Who's responsible for taking it down? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> aren't you asking for having your cake and eat it too? I would, uh, I would disagree with you, Your Honor, and, and say that this goes exactly to the heart of why we have statute of limitations, because the current owner, my client right now, was not the owner at the time that these images were posted. It was owned by his father, who managed all that. He had nothing to do with the social media and whatnot at that time. Uh, he, he doesn't know who posted them. He doesn't know when they were posted. He doesn't know anything, as he's read the deposition. He doesn't know anything about this. And that's why we have the statute of limitations. But he continues to benefit from right. the use of the images. And so I'm assuming that the, that the knowledge of the father is imputed uh, to this particular uh, defendant. I, I would uh, respectfully disagree with you there, Your Honor, and say that these images are for specific events, Monday night football games where the Patriots are playing, I forget who they're playing uh, in one case, uh, that occurred back in 2013 and now are buried in the Facebook log. And I'm assuming there's some sort of indemnity with the father. His father passed. His, his father passed, right? Your Honor. There's no. In but but that's the again. I, I, you're over your time, but I, I don't know that that necessarily helps you with what we have on the rec in the record. But thank you. you. And I would like the letter on the yeah. cases that you're talking yeah. about, mm -hmm. and and a response too. Um, if if he submits cases, it'd be useful to hear from you on whether there are other cases going the other way. Absolutely, Your Honor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If you can get it in within a week. Yes, Your Honor. 